Good afternoon. My name is Sam Harahan, and I am uh, delighted today to record a, a, a short video with regard to the Council of Court Excellence work on the one day one trial jury reform, which was one of the most important um, efforts that we did in the first decade of the council's work. Uh, my history with the council is that I was the founding executive director um, and came online uh, January 1982 and served for 20 years in that capacity. Uh, since then, for another 20 years, I've been an active member of the board of directors and worked on various projects. Now, let me return to the, uh, to the topic. Um, the work of the Council for Court Excellence was an outgrowth of a major uh, research study by the uh, District of Columbia Bar uh, called the Court uh, Reform uh, 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 study, and it was uh, chaired by a distinguished uh, a lawyer named Charles A. Horsky, and it is generally known in the community as the Horsky Report, at least among bar circles. Uh, it, that report looked at the operations of the court and uh, from a variety of standpoints, and one of its recommendations was that the District of Columbia courts should, like the Montgomery County, Maryland courts had done earlier, adopt a uh, more user-friendly jury system uh, called the one day one trial uh, jury system. Um, beginning in 1982, when the Council for Court Excellence uh, was founded, uh, we had a series of working committees and one of them was a jury committee which began uh, examining the issue of what are the impediments to uh, reducing the term of jury service. Uh, at that time, some 8,000 uh, citizens a year uh, served in the DC Superior Court's jury, um, and they served for approximately periods of two weeks. Um, in the 1970s, they were serving for upwards of 30 days. So it was a marked improvement. But in any event, we, we uh, <coughs> convened a broad-based committee, which included uh, lawyers and lay people who'd served on jury duty and uh, business uh, uh, participants and uh, some members of the court family, notably from the jury office and the clerk's office, uh, there may have been a judge or two involved. I don't remember at this particular point. But in any event, the committee worked to uh, draft legislation, which um, because it was involving the structure of the court, it would have to be passed by the U.S. Congress, not simply passed by the District of Columbia uh, D.C. Council. Um, so we knew we had a tall order in, in, in mind. So um, in any event, the committee worked uh, for uh, about as I recall, uh, the better part of two years uh, to develop uh, this draft legislation. Um, uh, I met along with the committee chair on several occasions with staff of the, uh, of the uh, House and Senate district committees uh, to keep them apprised of what we were doing. Um, we obviously briefed the courts along the way as well. Um, the uh, bill um, had a number of significant uh, uh, elements to it, and I'd like to kind of go through those. Um, the, the good news is that the statute did pass the U.S. Congress uh, in 1986 uh, in the 99th Congress of the final hours of that Congress. Um, the uh, um, Charles Mathias, as a matter of fact, the chair of the Senate D.C. committee uh, moved the passage of that uh, bill, I believe, on the last day of the 99th Congress, as I recall. Um, the elements of the bill uh, were a number of things. First, it reduced or eliminated virtually all uh, previous uh, statutory exemptions from jury duty. Uh, for example, in the DC courts, uh, if you were a licensed practical nurse or a firefighter or uh, a, I think a mortician or a medical doctor, I mean, they were just, there were scads and scads of exemptions. And so by reducing the term of jury service to one day or one trial, the argument was that, that everyone uh, can do their civic duty. So that was an, that's an element of it. Um, it also, um, while the statute didn't mandate the D.C. courts to set up a one day one trial, the legislative record was was abundantly clear that that was the intention of Congress. Um, and it, it encouraged uh, the D.C. Uh, courts to create a jury plan setting up the one day one trial jury statute. Um, fast forwarding, um, it took the courts after the passage of the statute about two years to actually do their jury plan. Um, but um, it the net effect was that instead of having 8,000 citizens serve two weeks, you had roughly 50,000 uh, citizens uh, serving on juries in the D.C. Superior Court um, uh, on a, 
uh, on a much more reduced uh, level of, of participation. It was also a much broader jury pool, and so it was a more representative pool of the entire community. Um, one of the arguments that we had in, in really even putting this as a priority of the Council of Court of Excellence uh, was that our courts are not exactly uh, something that most people understand or ever encounter. And so the, the idea was that if we had more citizens coming into court and seeing the workings of the court by serving on juries, uh, they would have a much better appreciation of the importance of the court and the procedures the courts use and the role of the different uh, parties from the judges to the lawyers to this, that, and the other. So um, in any event, it was a big success. And uh, uh, I can say that for the first 10 years or more uh, of the Council for Court Excellence work after that, uh, particularly when I was meeting with business and civic uh, uh, groups, uh, they would basically uh, be very impressed that, oh, you are the group that uh, that uh, were behind the one day, one trial jury reform. So uh, that concludes this particular report. My name is Sam Harahan, and I am the founding staff director of the Council for Court Excellence. My association with the council began at its beginning, which was January 1982, and I served in that role for 20 years. Um, I uh, continue uh, for another 20 years to be on the active uh, board of directors and participate in projects here and there. So today I'd like to describe uh, the background and an interesting project that I had a, kind of a particular affinity for. Um, and it was the work, work we did in the mid 80s to develop a child neglect practice manual. Um, the project began as uh, many of the uh, work of the organization uh, did, and that is from ideas from people outside the organization or on our board of directors. Um, in this particular case, I had uh, a visit by uh, three uh, ladies who I did not know, and they were practicing attorneys in the area of child abuse and neglect law. Uh, I think they were Justine Dunlap, Diane Weinroth, and Helen Clara Hudson, as I recall. And they came to me and said, you know, the, we practice every day in the Superior Courts Family Division in the child neglect, neglect calendar, and that the quality of advocacy and the quality of judging is quite uneven, and it adversely affects uh, children, it adver adversely affects families, and that uh, could we uh, take on a project uh, to develop a practice manual or a reference manual uh, for judges and lawyers and social workers who work in that particular field. Um, I thank the ladies for raising my awareness to this particular issue, um, but told them that I really thought that this was a project that was more appropriate for the bar or the young lawyers or one of the other uh, uh, legal groups to, to tackle, um, but that if after they checked those groups out, they didn't get any takers, uh, come back and we'd see what we could do. Well, sure enough, several months later, they came back and said that they struck out, uh, that they talked to the people in the, these other groups and that none of them were interested or able to take on a project of that magnitude at the time. I indicated that I would be happy to get, uh, uh, to take soundings my executive committee, but that if I could raise the, the financial support we'd need uh, to do that, and if the three of them would sign on to help us with the development of the, of the project, um, and we could recruit an appropriate uh, drafting committee, I would be very happy to do it. I also, I think, indicated that uh, the then presiding judge of the family division, Ricardo Urbina, who subsequently joined the U.S. District Court, uh, but he was the chair of the family uh, division of the Superior Court. Uh, I thought that if I could recruit uh, uh, Judge Urbina to chair the committee, um, that it would add prestige to the effort and uh, facilitate our, our getting the project done. So. In any event, we, we embarked on this project, and uh, it was a, really a very significant uh, effort. Um, the, the project, um, uh, for example, uh, uh, deals, and I'm going to read from, from some of the materials, uh, the project uh, dealt with, if you will, um, issues um, regarding, let me find my notes here, sorry, um, manual chapters, for example, uh, that of the completed uh, manual when, when it was done, um, covered a whole wide range of procedural steps involving child abuse and neglect cases uh, through the Superior Court um, and the relevant statutory law and rules governing areas, including termination of parental rights, adoption, medical and psychiatric treatment, ethical issues, and more. Um, the, our first uh, uh, version of the manual, and I have a uh, kind of a show and tell visual of the, of the document, our first 
uh, version of the manual was done in, uh, I think it was 1986. Um, subsequently, there was a second edition that we uh, worked with the young lawyer section of the bar to do. But um, it was a very, very uh, uh, interesting project in the sense that the, the the practicing lawyers who work in the child abuse and neglect field are, for the most part, solo practitioners. And so they did not have the back office uh, capacity to uh, do the research needed uh, to really do a first class manual. And so what we did was to uh, have them identify people who could take the lead on drafting the chapters, for example, on housing or on termination of parental rights or mental health issues or whatever. And then we partnered those individuals up with uh, some of our board member law firms. And so I remember Williams and Conley and Hogan and Hartson and Aaron Fox and, and many other of, of the uh, active members of the Council for Court Excellence Board were very happy to assign uh, young associates to uh, work with these experienced child abuse and neglect lawyers uh, to actually draft the sections of the uh, and do the, the actual research uh, to develop the project. So. Anyway, it was a big success, and, and I felt uh, really uh, very, very uh, good about its, uh, its uh, culmination. Um, I'll fast forward a few years, uh, and we had uh, a recruitment breakfast to get new uh, people interested in the council's work. And uh, one of the people who uh, participated in this particular breakfast, I remember, was uh, Judge jo Jeffrey Alperin. Uh, Judge Alperin had been in the D.C. Uh, Corporation Council's office and uh, later joined the, the Superior Court bench. When, when we were talking around the, uh, around the table uh, about people's past awareness of the Council for Court Excellence, he indicated that, that he uh, got a notice from the uh, presiding judge about six months or a year earlier that he was going to be assigned once again to the family court. And he said he absolutely dreaded having to be in the abuse and neglect calendar. And then he was given a copy of the, the Council for Court Excellence Child Neglect Practice Manual, and he said it made all the difference in the world in terms of his confidence and comfort level of working in those areas, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I have no doubt that the document was of, of tremendous value to, uh, uh, to the court, to the social workers, uh, to the practicing lawyers, and to every other uh, individual who touched uh, that particular subject to the law. Um, we also, by the way, did... Uh, uh, one or two uh, educational programs and a full day uh, programs uh, and attracted well over 100 people, as I recall, uh, to go through the manual and to to discuss some of the different uh, topics involved. So it's a big, a big project and a, and a very significant one and one that I think had it not been for our involvement, it probably wouldn't have happened. So that concludes this particular report. Good afternoon. My name is Sam Harahan, and I was the founding staff director of the Council for Court Excellence. Uh, having started uh, the organization in January of 1982, um, I continued in that role until 2002. And for the past 20 years after that, I've continued as an active member of the board of directors. Um, I uh, today would like to talk about the Council for Court Excellence work in the area of legislative reform. Um, Many, many of the projects uh, that the organization does uh, will have a implementation uh, dimension to them. Sometimes those implementation dimensions uh, are of a legislative character. Uh, for example, early on, we were looking at the issue of uh, the small claims uh, court. And uh, I think at that time, the statutory limit uh, for filing in the small claims court was $750. Well, it took uh, an act of uh, US Congress in order to make any changes in that. And so uh, a very small but significant, if you uh, are a citizen without an attorney but have a, a legitimate uh, claim, um, increasing that jurisdiction, which the court supported from $750 to $2,000, uh, made, a, made a real difference in people's lives. And of course, it helped an impact in increasing the caseload of the court. But the important thing was to really continue and improve uh, public access. Uh, but uh, over the years, the council was involved uh, in, in my 20 years of being the staff director in a number of different legislative uh, uh, efforts. Uh, these ranged uh, from uh, the Jury Reform uh, Act of 1986, which passed the U.S. Congress uh, and created the one-day, one-trial jury reform, um, to victim rights legislation in the D.C. Uh, 
city council, uh, probate reform legislation, uh, and many other types of uh, the development of the Office of Administrative Hearings uh, project uh, had a legislative uh, uh, dimension. Um, and uh, uh, more recently, uh, uh, there have been uh, other efforts, uh, most recently, uh, for, for example, the area of forensic science is something that the council was kind of involved in. But um, over the years, we've also uh, taken on uh, legislative efforts that were uh, important, but way, way, way under the radar screen. Uh, I remember, for example, uh, getting a call from uh, uh, Bill Taylor, who at the point was the chair of the Judicial Disabilities and Tenure Commission. And uh, he uh, uh, called to my attention the fact that there was a, uh, a drafting error, he thought, in the Court Reorganization Act, which set up the Superior Court, in that uh, judges who took senior status in the District of Columbia trial or appellate courts could continue sitting in that court uh, indefinitely whereas act active judges uh, were required to have a mandatory fitness review uh, uh, when they came up for reappointment uh, and at various points in their, in their tenure. So uh, it was Mr. Taylor's view uh, and, uh, uh, that we should basically correct that legislative oversight and uh, provide for some type of periodic fitness review uh, for uh, judges who are in senior status who wish to continue serving. Um, what Mr. Taylor didn't know is that when I was research director of the uh, bar's uh, court, uh, major court study in the late 70s and early 80s, that I had done a study of the family court. And uh, it, this involved uh, interviews, uh, structured interviews with uh, 60 or 70 attorneys across the city. Uh, and uh, I had a question at the end of the survey about are there other issues that they'd like to bring to the attention of the committee. And in about a dozen of those 70 interviews, the uh, attorney indicated uh, that, uh, well, this has been a waste of my time, Mr. Arahan, if, uh, if uh, you uh, or someone does not address the, the conduct of uh, two uh, senior judges who actively sit in the family court and who uh, really are uh, making remarks from the, from the bench in open court that are uh, completely uh, beyond the pale and uh, were uh, uh, inappropriate and, and adversary of, of, of an adverse nature to the uh, to the litigants that they represented. Um, I won't go into the details of what those remarks were. I do know what they were, but uh, um, anyway, it, it got my attention. And so uh, uh, I took that issue to the executive committee uh, of the uh, uh, bars uh, court study committee, and they indicated that I should meet with uh, Chief Judge Carl Moultrie since these judges sat at the uh, uh, at the pleasure of uh, the chief judge or at the discretion of the chief judge. Um, so I met with Chief Judge Moultrie. I explained that I did not know these two uh, judges personally at all, um, but that we had done interviews of 70 attorneys across the city from uh, route from you know, Ward 1 through Ward 8. And uh, uh, there was a, a in about uh, 15 or 20 percent of these interviews, uh, these two judges uh, uh, conduct was uh, was identified. The chief judge thanked me for, for bringing this to his attention. He indicated that it was a very difficult issue, um, but that he would address it. Um, well, fast forward several years, I get the call from Bill Taylor, knowing that these judges continue to sit and that uh, uh, no changes have been made by the uh, District of Columbia Court uh, with regard to reassigning them. Um, we developed a, a very simple statute uh, drafted. Uh, I met with uh, people in the White House to make sure that if we uh, got the bill through the Congress that they would not, because uh, uh, I knew the fur would fly once the once the bill uh, uh, passed. So anyway, um, the long story short is that the, uh, uh, the bill uh, uh, passed uh, both houses of Congress. It went to uh, uh, President Reagan, and I got a call from the general counsel's office there indicating that they were getting a great deal of pressure from uh, senior judges and the local courts and their friends uh, and asking uh, President Reagan to veto the bill. Um, I um, caucused with my executive committee, which included uh, one or two active judges in the local courts. And it was the decision of the executive committee of the Council for Court Excellence that we should uh, not uh, withdraw our support for the bill. The bill passed, uh, excuse me, President Reagan signed the bill. And within a period of less than 30 days, these two judges retired from the court. So um, my point being that there, 
there's lots of areas of legislation that uh, uh, doesn't make the headlines, but is of significant importance to uh, to the lives of, of people who come into our court system. So I felt very good that the Council for Court Excellence was part of that. So um, that uh, concludes this particular report. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Sam Harahan, and I was the founding staff director of the Council for Court Excellence. I began work at the Council in January of 1982 when we commenced operation and continued in that role until June of 2002. Uh, for 20 years thereafter, I've continued as an active member of the Council's board and worked on various projects. Uh, today, I'd like to talk about one of the kind of more low-key projects, but one that I thought was uh, both notable and, uh, and at the time uh, and continue today, uh, felt was an important dimension of our work. Um, and that was um, because we're in the nation's capital, uh, there are many uh, uh, judges from around the world and judicial officials, uh, attorneys general, uh, and others who come to uh, Washington and meet with uh, the American Bar Association or the Federal Judicial Center or the U.S. Congress or others. And that um, I would get calls maybe 10 or 15 times a year uh, to ask whether uh, a group of uh, judges from uh, some foreign uh, jurisdiction might uh, uh, come by and visit with me because <clears throat> the Council uh, for Court Excellence is a, is a hybrid organization, if you will. We are <clears throat> certainly civically drawn, uh, driven, uh, uh, and uh, I was a non, I was an am a non lawyer, and and uh, in any event, it was an unusual. Uh, you know, they were used to meeting with bar groups and with lawyers and with judges and uh, this and the other, but uh, uh, meeting with a civic organization that was working to support the courts and to work on uh, reform of the courts was, was kind of an unusual uh, breed. Um, I would get calls from the U.S. State Department. I would get calls from the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, from the World uh, Bank, uh, uh, from uh, uh, sometimes uh, third-party uh, nonprofits that were hired by the federal uh, government to uh, basically uh, handle the the uh, tours of, uh, of international judicial groups. So um, the, the what my my discussions with with uh, jurists was essentially to first give them kind of an understanding of how we came to be and the uh, and the makeup of our organization and then to share whatever current projects we were working on, whether it was jury reform or whether it was uh, civil delay reduction or uh, child abuse uh, uh, and judicial education programs that we were doing and uh, things of that nature. So it really, I took my direction from the, uh, after I gave up 15 or 20 minute summary, um, I really took direction from the uh, people who were visiting with us. Um, there were some interesting uh, visitors. Uh, I remember, for example, the general counsel of the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, who was a, a man from uh, uh, Bogota, Colombia, uh, and uh, um, he was very interested in, in our work. And uh, at that particular point, which was must have been 1986, 87, uh, Columbia was uh, dealing with a horrific uh, uh, drug uh, problem. Uh, the Medellin cartel was active. Uh, there was cocaine uh, exporting to the United States and other places in the world. And they were just under uh, on a tremendous pressure to, uh, to uh, basically both protect their judges, but also to improve the backbone of the civil society. And uh, the gentleman's name, I think, was Nestor Martinez. Uh, he went back and became attorney general in Colombia and uh, uh, contacted me one day and asked whether I would uh, uh, come down and uh, describe the work of the Council for Court Excellence uh, to groups uh, in uh, in Colombia. Um, and so um, I, I actually took two trips uh, there and uh, each one was about four or five days. And I believe either the World Bank or the uh, uh, USAID uh, underwrote the cost of those trips and stuff. But that was that was notable. A couple of years later, I was invited by uh, the World Bank, which was then working on issues of both rule of law and civil society uh, development. Um, and uh, they asked if I would go to uh, uh, Venezuela. Uh, I think uh, Chavez would, had recently come in as the president of the country. I don't remember the dates uh, specifically, but in any event, they asked me if I would uh, uh, go to Venezuela and uh, describe 
uh, the work of the Council of Court Excellence, et cetera, et cetera, and, and uh, meet with groups there. And I think the host was a uh, Alianza, as I recall, uh, organization, uh, which was a kind of a large NGO in uh, uh, in Venezuela. And uh, over the course of the uh, of that week, I uh, briefed various and sundry groups. Uh, I was just going through some notes in my own files the other day, and I came across a uh, an interesting little summary of, uh, of one of the meetings I had, uh, which um, uh, just I'll, I'll I'll read a little bit the excerpts from it. Uh, uh, it indicates that uh, um, on October, um, looks like it was October eight, October 19th or 20th, um, there was a luncheon in my honor hosted by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Justice Sosa, and it was attended by two other justices, the Attorney General, uh, a law professor, member of Italianza, uh, a representative of the British Chamber of Commerce, which was very involved in civil uh, uh, society issues, um, and the chairman of the Judicial Committee of the Congress. Uh, the briefing and luncheon included a 10-minute uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation that the Chief Justice gave where she was highlighting different uh, ideas and proposals that uh, that they had. Uh, and uh, it was a very spirited meeting. And I, I thought coming back on the plane that I would have died and gone to heaven if I was ever invited by the Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court to come and have a brown bag lunch and talk about uh, court reform issues or or the work of the civil society in a in a very uh, uh, informal uh, setting. But in any event, I think those settings really serve to stimulate um, uh, both uh, the efforts of uh, of others uh, in Colombia. They set up a uh, uh, an organization. Uh, somewhat modeled on our on, on the Council of Court Excellence, but um, I've learned subsequently that the the kind of uh, Latin culture is to uh, have academic uh, focused groups, and so uh, the group in Colombia was not as as pragmatic or activist oriented as as the Council of Court Excellence. But um, to recap, these these efforts of uh, uh, of involvement of, of judicial groups. Uh, uh, from around the world was both a stimulating um, activity for the staff of the Council for Court Excellence and me per particularly, um, and I think served as a as an interesting um, leavening, if you will. Uh, uh, we had a tragedy in this world uh, when Anwar Sadat, the the head of Egypt, was uh, was assassinated, and I happened to have an, an a little conference room in the Council for Court Excellence, but about a year later the prosecuting attorney uh, in the uh, murder trial of Anwar Sadat uh, and the chief justice uh, of that, uh, of, who presided over that trial. So it was like a wow uh, kind of experience. But anyway, it was a very interesting uh, 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 segment of our work and, and one that I felt very good about.